Thanks for watching NTD Business. Coming up. Elon Musk changing course, saying he will go ahead with the deal to buy Twitter at the original price he offered. It sent Twitter shares soaring today. The founder of the world's largest hedge fund is giving up control, the final step in his plan to hand over the reins to a new generation. And U.S. job openings plunge in August compared to the month before. We hear from a recruitment firm and what they're seeing in the jobs market. With that and much more, coming up on NTD Business. It's great to have you with us. Paul Graney here. Could this be the beginning of a brand new Twitter? The world's richest man, Elon Musk, plans to go ahead with his deal to buy out the company. In a letter to the social media company, his lawyer says he intends to proceed with the deal on the term set in April. That means Musk will offer Twitter shareholders $54.20 per share, or in total, $44 billion to take the company private. The letter was made public just today. Twitter confirmed to receive the letter. Now Musk and Twitter are suing each other after the buyout deal almost fell apart earlier this year. Musk says Twitter wasn't transparent about fake accounts in the platform, but Twitter wants to force them to go through with the deal anyway. The trial is set for later this month in Delaware, but if this new plan goes ahead, the trial won't be necessary. Comment on the news, Wedbush analyst Dan Ives says it's a smart move for Musk, which will save him all the legal headaches. Many prominent conservatives celebrated the news. One of them said the first thing Musk should do after taking over is bring back President Trump. Twitter banned him last year after the January 6th Capitol breach. Twitter stock jumped 22% today, reaching $52. Pretty close to Musk's offer. We'll keep you updated. And Donald Trump, speaking of Trump, is suing CNN for defamation. He claims the media outlet used its influence as a leading news organization to defeat him politically. Former president says the network just recently ramped up its attacks because they fear he'll run for president again in 2024. Trump wants $475 million in punitive damages and $75 million in compensatory damages. His attorneys say CNN even claimed credit for, quote, getting Trump out in the 2020 presidential election. The filing also claims CNN tried to taint Trump in the minds of viewers with a series of scandalous, false and defamatory labels of racist, Russian lackey, insurrectionist and ultimately Hitler. Complaint notes the network has failed and refused to retract or correct their false and defamatory statements. Filing also notes that undercover footage captured of a CNN employee admitting the company's coverage was to convince viewers to vote him out of office. Again, we'll keep you updated. And the founder of the world's largest hedge fund is finally letting go. Billionaire Ray Dalio has given up control of Bridgewater Associates. That means he's entrusting its future and $150 billion in assets to a younger generation of investors. Today, he tweeted he feels great about the people and the machine now in control of the hedge fund. And although Dalio has stepped down as co-chief investment officer, he said he continues to be, he will continue to be a mentor, investor, and board member until he dies. The transition started 12 years ago. Dalio wanted his firm to outlive him, and he spent years trying to find the right mix of investors and executives to take over. Company says Dalio has transferred his majority stake to the board, but remains a, quote, meaningful owner of the fund. In the stock market, precious metals markets, and just about every market rallied today. That's despite some pretty grim economic news we'll get to later. Down on Wall Street, the Dow rose 825 points, 2 and 8 tenths of a percent. S&P gained 112 points or three and one-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq jumped 361 points, three and three-tenths of a percent. Good day on Wall Street today, right? But as I mentioned, some negative news on the U.S. economy today. Sorry to be a downer. Economists are starting to estimate the cost of devastation from Hurricane Ian. Some estimate the storm likely caused about $50 billion in damages to Florida, plus several more billion dollars of damage to South Carolina. That would make it one of the costliest natural disasters in recent history. According to Oxford Economics, it could slash third quarter economic growth in Florida and North Carolina by three and two percentage points respectively. 
Even the, nas the national economy could take a hit, putting a dent in gross domestic product growth in the near term. Another sign, warning sign for the economy, looks like the labor market starting to cool off. The number of job openings in the U.S. fell by a significant 10% in August in just one month. Layoffs also up slightly. Labor Department says 10.1 million job openings. Sounds like a lot. It is a lot, but it's the fewest since June of 2021. The most recent job openings in Labor Turnover Survey, commonly known as JOLTS, says there are nearly 1.7 vacancies for every person who's looking. That's a lot, but it is down slightly from July. Federal Reserve, though, likely happy the labor market may be cooling. It blames inflation on a strong jobs market. A less competitive jobs market means wages won't increase so much. The Fed claims that higher wages will lead to higher inflation. That is disputed, though. But here to talk to Entities Don Ma about the job drop in job openings is Sarah Gordon. She's the senior VP at recruitment firm Robert Half. Sarah, thanks for joining us today. So job openings in August dropped to the lowest level since June last year. I want to hear from your perspective. Are you seeing from your clients, are they hiring less? So from our perspective, this remains a, a very competitive job market. And you're right, we saw about a 10% drop in job openings, but we know they're still at historic highs. And there's 1.7 jobs for every unemployed person. So we, we're still seeing a huge level of competition in the market today. And on that point, 1.7 jobs available for every person looking. Now, this is down from two job openings previously. Yeah. Should, should we take this as sort of... Uh, are we starting to shift away from a job seekers market? I think that's a great question. I would still say this is that candidates are very confident in this market, and we see that in the quit rates. So we see quit rates have not declined at all. In fact, they're increasing. Workers are still looking for higher salaries. So we'll continue to see this trend of quits, I think, continue on into 2023, even if the job openings come down slightly. Now, you mentioned wages. Do you, do you expect wage increases to ease a bit in light of today's data? We expect wage increases to actually continue, especially given the economic conditions today. What we found in our research, interestingly, is that four out of 10 job seekers or workers would actually quit their jobs today to move to another job to make 10% more. So we see this trend continuing well into 2023. Tell me, at Robert, have what are your clients, what are employers telling you about their future hiring plans? We know that um, the majority of our of our clients continue to hire and continue to need skilled talent within their walls, and they're actually looking for creative ways to attract and retain talent. So that continues to be a huge push. And what we continue to tell them is there's really three things to focus on. First is salary. You have to make sure that that salary is competitive in the marketplace. The second would be remote work. We know remote work is here to stay and we can expect to see that trend continue. And then I would say third is really your approach to upskilling and reskilling, learning and development. We know a lot of our clients are in budget season right now. And so making sure that you have the right, the right investments to put forward into your uh, talent community in 2023 is gonna be a huge priority. But, but but does it concern you? You know, J Jerome Powell more or less made it clear that they're going to target the jobs market. Does that concern you? I, I think there's such a talent gap and skills gap that has developed over the course of the past few years, especially accelerated by the pandemic, that we'll continue to see demand for skilled labor stay at, at the level that it's at today or maybe increase depending on what employers need to make sure that they're um, carving the path to the future for their organization. Things like cybersecurity, um, different types of FinServe, that these are all really important topics that can only be filled with skilled, skilled talent, which we know is in short supply. But, but let's take a moment to look into a future for sure. a moment. Do you, do you see it as a possibility that if the Fed keeps going with the rate increases that we might sort of see the pendulum swing to the other side? Will we see instead of worker shortages that there will be job shortages? You know, if I had a crystal ball, I would probably be doing a lot more of these. So what I would say about um, about the economic uncertainty is that what we're seeing from all of our surveys, our salary uh, guide that we just published, and a lot of different outlets is that that demand continues to actually increase, especially in those skilled talent uh, 
talent position. So I think that we have a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of runway ahead of us, but we anticipate that demand will continue to be strong in those sectors. All right, thank you very much, Sarah Gordon, Senior VP at Robert Half. Pleasure speaking to you today. Thanks, Dean. In today's special report, we head over to the UK, where the UK government is fast-forwarding the publication of its debt-cutting plan. How does that sound to you in America? The man behind the plan, Finance Minister Kwasi Kwarteng, has been facing tremendous pressure the past 11 days. If you've been watching us, you know. It's after he announced his low-tax pro-growth mini-budget in Parliament. He went through market chaos, widespread criticism, and a number of very hostile interviews. Yesterday, he had to get rid of a key part of the agenda because of all the negativity. And today, he says he will officially publish his proposal for cutting debt later this month instead of waiting till, next, uh, waiting till November 23rd. Many are worried that Quartang's mini-budget will increase government debt because it's filled with tax cuts. I'll explain. It lowers taxes in many ways. It cancels a scheduled increase in the main corporate tax rate it also reduces the bottom income tax rate and also cuts the land transfer tax. A lot of tax cuts. Sounds good. But because of these tax cuts, the government may receive less revenue, especially in the short term. Kortang hopes, though, economic growth will increase revenue in the long term. But can anyone really predict the future? So with less revenue, the government may have to borrow more. In other words, increase its debt to continue spending. The UK's debt level is already pretty high. Its debt-to-GDP ratio, about 100%. Debt-to-GDP is like a measure of its ability to pay off what it owes. International lenders and investors watch it carefully. Investors may believe that the additional borrowing could make it harder for the UK to pay off its debt. And printing more money to make up the difference could make inflation worse there. It's already at historically high levels. And if the UK's debt and deficits weren't so high, the market may have reacted better to the tax cuts and they may just have gone through without a problem. That didn't happen. Kortang is under pressure to lower the country's debt-to-GDP ratio now. This could involve painful spending cuts. One UK think tank estimates it may cost $52 billion worth of cuts to benefits, infrastructure projects and government departments to bring it down. UK's debt at about $3.3 trillion. It's the sixth largest in the world. Its biggest expense, social protection, similar to social security here in the States. Serves people with pensions, and these pensioners tend to vote conservative, Kortang's party. Cutting their benefits may change how they vote, but it could mean $5 to $12 billion in savings for the government. Cutting spending on public infrastructure such as hospitals and schools could save $28 billion. And cutting public sector jobs could save $11 billion. Would go a long way to Quartang's tax cutting plans. But the cuts may not go down well with voters. As you can see, Quartang is indeed in a fix. So will we find ourselves in the same fix in America if we try to cut our taxes? Well, our national debt is by far the world's largest, reaching nearly $31 trillion. Is it sustainable? Chief Economist of the American Legislative Exchange Council, Jonathan Williams, says it isn't even close to sustainable. One of the little discussed elements of this is just how much is it going to cost federal taxpayers across the board in terms of higher interest payments on this increasing federal debt. Um, so the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, assumed that for 2022, we're going to have roughly $400 billion in interest costs on this elevated national debt. Now, you go back to the Obama administration, and uh, we're relatively paying a cheap amount of $200 billion a year on federal interest costs. That is doubled now in the last decade. William says our debt is climbing higher and higher and it'll cost more and more in interest payments over time. However, there are some who say that that doesn't matter, that the U.S. can keep printing more dollars because it's the world's reserve currency. The U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, so everyone wants it, basically. Governments worldwide store up large amounts. People worldwide like to trade in the dollar currency. This makes the U.S. borrowing more manageable since there's always demand for dollars. But Williams doesn't think this is an end-all, be-all solution. 
has kept us uh, away from a default position that other countries would have seen probably long ago if they weren't the world reserve currency. Now, uh, thinking critically about that, though, you know, every day, I think the Communist Party of China, as well as Russia and other adversaries around the globe are looking for ways to dethrone the dollar uh, for many reasons. And so this ought to be something that keeps policymakers up at night because there are major global powers out there that would love to see uh, the dollar as not the reserve currency. And unlike Quartang in the UK, the US government isn't really considering cutting spending, it seems. Politicians may be unwilling to do it because, as in the UK, maybe it'll turn off voters. And in other news, as countries in Europe rush to obtain natural gas, one result is a shortage of available ships to transport the fuel from the United States. This is causing shipping rates to climb to record highs. And today's Sean Marshall has more. Europe is racing to replace Russian pipeline flows with liquefied natural gas, or LNG, from other suppliers, including the U.S. and Nigeria. This is presenting yet another problem to the global gas supply this winter. Fewer ships and higher shipping rates. According to Bloomberg, Shell booked a ship to take a U.S. cargo to Europe for $400,000 a day. Gas traders said this is likely the most expensive ever for the Atlantic Basin. Gale India Limited booked another ship to load a cargo from the U.S. at about $360,000 a day. The rates for Atlantic LNG shipping have increased over 300% in one month, according to Spark Commodities. And buyers are snatching up all available LNG transports and holding on to them in case they're needed right away. Gas traders say the buyers don't want to be left with no supply if it gets unusually cold this winter. Sean Marshall, NTD News. But despite the energy crisis in Europe, Germany's largest power producer, RWE, is speeding up its plan to phase out coal by eight years. They're getting ready to stop generating coal-based electricity in 2030 as part of the deal with the government. German Minister of Economic Affairs Robert Habeck said it today. At the same time, energy security must, of course, be guaranteed for 2030 and beyond. That's why we will issue a request for bids for hydrogen gas power plants. That is, gas power plants that can then be converted to hydrogen as quickly as possible. Habeck also said that the two RWE coal-fired plants would stay online until March 2024 to help ensure Germany's energy security. To offset the impact on the region, RWE plans to build three gigawatts of gas-fired power plant capacity, which will also be ready to run on hydrogen. And Apple will have to switch chargers soon in the European Union. European Parliament approving new rules today that will introduce a single charging port for cell phones, tablets and cameras by 2024. USB-C connectors used by Android-based devices will be the EU standard. Today we are replacing this pile of chargers with just this. The simplest solutions are often the best and most practical ones. Got a lot of chargers. The new rule will force Apple to change its charging port for iPhones and other devices. The change comes after iPhone and Android users complained about having to switch to different chargers for the devices. Ever go to a friend's house, they didn't have your correct charger? That's the idea. Apple's expected to be among the most affected. The deal also covers e-readers, earbuds and other technologies with analysts saying the rule may also have an impact on Samsung and Huawei. And Poshmark will make its mark on the world as the plan at least. The platform lets you buy and sell everything from clothes to electronics and it just got bought up by Naver, South Korean internet giant for 1.2 billion dollars. Head of Poshmark says the move will expand the company's global reach. The resale market is pretty hot right now. It's already gaming steam going into 2020 because of environmentally conscious shoppers who wanted to buy used instead of new. Then it boomed during the pandemic as people started cleaning out their closets.
Welcome back. A symbol of Christmas cheer will cost more this year. Christmas tree farms say they say people can expect to pay more for the perfect evergreen this year. A survey of 55 wholesale Christmas tree growers found that 71% expect to raise wholesale prices. The growers account for about two thirds of nationwide supply. Many of them plan to charge retailers 5 to 15% more, with some even saying their trees will be 20% more. Tree farms don't expect shortages though because this year's harvest looks pretty good. But they say operating costs have gone up over the last year. That includes everything from labor and raw materials to shipping trees to retailers. Christmas is coming though, that's good news. And flight attendants will soon be getting more rest time in between flights. They'll have at least 10 hours off duty between shifts. That's one more hour than they currently have. Federal aviation officials announced the change today and it's welcome news for flight crew unions who've been fighting for more rest time. The union says flight attendants are heavily fatigued and overworked after clocking in about 14 hours. Airlines are aware of the coming change. The rule goes into effect in 30 days and airlines have up to 90 days to comply. And over in the Middle East, the mountains of Yemen have been home to some of the world's best coffee beans for hundreds of years. But the coffee trade has suffered amid the country's civil war. Anthony's Andrew Thomas has the details. According to a United Nations report, Yemen currently produces an estimated 20,000 tons of coffee annually, compared to Ethiopia's 400,000 tons. The export value of Yemen's coffee was $17 million in 2019, but that's still low according to the report. To revive the reputation of Yemeni coffee, many local producers and entrepreneurs are experimenting with specialty beans. As part of the efforts to revive the heritage and culture of Yemeni coffee and link it to international standards, many specialty coffee shops and stores have opened to offer high-quality Yemeni coffee at international standards. This led to people experimenting with many methods of making coffee, both at home and at these places. Durar hopes to break into markets in Asia, Europe and the United States. Some of their efforts include sourcing the best quality beans, taste testing, and using lavish packaging. They're also working on expanding the domestic market. One Sana'a resident said he was excited to see local coffee brands pop up across the city. With the different businesses that were recently opened, and Mocha Hunters was among the first of these, we were introduced to various kinds of Yemeni coffee, such as Harazi, Hawari, Odaini, and Haimi. So we now have a kind of taste and expertise in choosing the quality of coffee but the nation's seven-year-old civil war continues to present challenges for local producers. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. As the latest for NTD Business team and myself, Paul Graney. Follow me on Twitter, though, if you're there, please. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us, business at ntd.com. We'd love to hear from you. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.